Just a uh, really uh, brief introduction. Um, my name's Andrew. I'm a uh, um, software engineer and uh, freelance author. Um, that's about all you really need to uh, know about that. I work for a uh, startup uh, called MyVBO. We're uh, um, a business software as a service. Um, we use CakePHP entirely for back-end development. We do not use it for our front-end at all. We just expose everything via APIs, and uh, our front ends are in Flex, uh, HTML, um, outside of Cake, uh, iPads, iPods, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, I was toying with a few subtitles for this presentation. I ended up uh, settling on Become a Platform, but uh, um, just for the heck of it, I'll throw out the other two. Um, Cake PHP for backend development and uh, Cake PHP for web services. Uh, just to give you a general idea, what I'll be talking about for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, yesterday, uh, Neil went over the uh, building a plugin to develop APIs. Um, I'm going to uh, fall back on that a couple times because I think it ties in nicely. Uh, today, I'm going to be uh, breaking up into two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be just basic uh, cake setup uh, for anybody who's not done an API in cake before. And the uh, second part is going to be uh, throwing in a few, uh, a few extras. All right. Um, so this should be just about everybody in the room, but uh, let me see a show of hands if your Cake PHP uh, project handles any kind of data whatsoever. If you have a model, you should be raising your hand. Um, all right, hey, keep them up. Keep them up. Uh, now uh, put them down if you uh, don't have an API. All right, so. All of you should have been able to keep your hands up. Um, I'm a firm believer that if you have data, uh, you should have, a, uh, have an API. It's kind of a, a why not kind of question. Um, you know, if, if you have the data, why not become the platform for that data? Um, you really have no reason not to. Cake PHP makes it really, really easy for you. Um, it doesn't matter if the platform is incredibly simple. A blog is a platform. Um, a, uh, you know, it has an API for making posts, it has RSS feed for syndication, et cetera. Um, I'm guessing that there were probably a few people who put down their hand that are probably like, oh yeah, I have an RSS feed. I have an API, kind of. Um, so uh, now that I uh, lowered the bar a little bit for, uh, creating an API, I hope everybody uh, goes out and does a at least a little something afterwards. Um, so back to the uh, title, um, Becoming a Platform. Uh, there's really two types of platforms uh, you can go down. Uh, there's the internal only, which gets you quite a few benefits, uh, um, you know, other otherwise known as a closed API or a walled garden or what have you. Um, the two big benefits it gets you is uh, instant uh, ability to build one uh, backend code base and deploy to multiple platforms, iPhones, iPads, um, obviously the web, desktops, uh, Blackberries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other benefit is that you can scale the front end and the back end independently. Um, so uh, if you blow up like uh, Twitter, uh, you can, um, you can keep your front end light and uh, throw out as many API servers as you can possibly want, assuming you're on the cloud and you're not buying hundreds of computers or anything like that. Um, the second option, um, which has a lot more benefits, is the external open API, and I really hope everybody uh, in the room today uh, considers that, you know, unless you're a hospital or military or something like that where you have a reason not to, oh, uh, um, there's a ton of benefits. Uh, everything that is a benefit of the closed API plus a uh, few extras, mainly growth. Uh, you can gain a user base that grows your company more than you can possibly imagine, particularly because they make mashups, they uh, innovate um, in ways that you may have not intended. Uh, they use your products in ways that you'd never 
um, that you didn't build your product for, but hey, you know, it, it grows, it's organic. Um, and you gain evangelists because if somebody's building a product on your platform, they're gonna want you to stick around and they're gonna want you to grow because your success is tied in with them. Um, and if you really need a buzzword to go back to your uh, boss or investors or whatnot to, and uh, get them to uh, um, sign off on you working on an API, uh, just bring up the platform play. Uh, it, wor it worked for Facebook, it worked for Twitter, it worked for Google, so uh, it might work for you, hopefully. Um, I kind of skipped ahead and went to my next slide, actually. Um, so if this was five years ago, I'd have a really tough time making this sell, but fortunately it's not uh, five years ago. We have a lot of use cases out there that have proven that developing APIs work really, really well. Twitter, Facebook, Bitly, Amazon, uh, and Salesforce, for instance, would be nothing like what they are today if they had not opened up their API, um, especially Twitter, which is why I kind of bolded them up there. Um, so, uh, you know, it's almost a mandatory requirement for applications now, more so than nice to have, to have an API. Um, so types of APIs, uh, there's pretty much two patterns you can go to. There's more, but uh, they're not nearly as well known. Um, the first is uh, REST, which uh, Neil went over um, yesterday uh, briefly, and the second is remote procedure calls. Um, and within those, you can have a number of different formats and protocols. The most common are XML and JSON, uh, but YAML, AMF, uh, et cetera. Uh, I am gonna be focusing on REST uh, today, which is, uh, as Neil mentioned, representational state uh, transfer. Um, it's resource-based. Um, everything in REST is a resource, and you can call them collectively nouns. Um, and there are five verbs that can act in that nouns in uh, HTTP, which is obviously the uh, um, most widespread example of REST. Um, they are get, put, post, delete, uh, and head. I'm sure everybody in the room knows those five, probably. Um, I'm not gonna even touch on head and put because they're uh, not used nearly as often. Um, but the last important fact about um, REST is it is really, really easy in uh, um, cake PHP, um, ridiculously easy. So uh, today's app, um, just so I have something to use as an example, is a URL shortening website. I chose it because it's probably the simplest thing I could possibly think of. Um, it just has simple user authentication and CRUD for a URLs object. So just two models, URLs, users. Uh, users can be pretty much the same as uh, the one in the uh, cookbook. And URLs, it's just ID, user ID, URL created, bonafide. I actually have a much more advanced version of this running in production, but that's like 20 fields and I wanna make this uh, simple. Um, so this is really all you need to make a RESTful service in uh, Cake PHP. Um, just stick that uh, second bullet point there in your uh, routes, uh, routes config file. Um, users is the, uh, uh, the resource I want to map. That, what that'll do is that'll auto create six routes for you. You can create them manually, this just is shorter. Um, you know, two get methods, uh, for those familiar with, uh, unfamiliar with REST, I'll quickly go over them. Uh, two get methods, one without an ID that just calls index on your controller, one with an ID that calls uh, view on your controller, um, and uh, two post methods, uh, one without an ID that calls uh, create, or add, sorry, and uh, one with an ID that calls edit, and um, uh, put is pretty much a synonym for edit, um, in a full RESTful application, you'd actually want to replace the entire record if you get put. So if the field's not set, null it out, et cetera. Um, so it's not really a pure edit. Um, so uh, 
and uh, obviously delete, which is probably uh, pretty self-explanatory. And I just blatantly stole this from the cookbook. Uh, the URLs on the bottom um, for that table. Uh, one quick caveat I wanted to touch on. This is a bit, uh, no real good segue into this. Um, there's a, a security thing you have to watch out for, which is kind of why the re one of the way reasons REST is set the way it is. Um, there's a type of attack. How many of you have heard of a CSRF attack, CSRF? Awesome, so I'd probably, uh, that's about half of you. Um, it's a uh, cross-site request forgery, um, which is pretty much, uh, can be as simple as just embedding an image on an external site with a action that uh, edits or modifies data, deletes things, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which is exactly why you only want to use uh, post and put to write data and delete to delete data because if get um, has the ability to modify data uh, via query strings or what have you, you run all hell breaks loose. Um, you know, somebody with a, a script kitty could come along and uh, get an image tag that can completely destroy your site um, if they get enough of your users to go there, of course. So. It's not enough to uh, just do the map resource. That'll get you the uh, that'll get you all the rest methods working. But another important aspect for building an API, I think, is uh, to get the extensions working so you can have multiple views in the same data without having to create plugins or other controllers or things like that. Um, that's done via turning on part. Uh, parse extensions in your routes config, which will tell, uh, tell the router to pay attention to file extensions. Um, I'm sure most of you have probably used that at some point. Um, and the request handler component, which takes that extension and uses it to switch layouts and views, um, include helpers if uh, the extension's XML and you have an XML helper, uh, request handler will uh, include that for you automatically. And uh, it also, uh, as a little side bonus, it parses incoming XML on posts. But uh, who uses XML anyway? Uh, so uh, this is, uh, just, I decided to throw that in, uh, that last little code example in on the bottom. Um, that is what it would look like if you were to create map a REST resource manually. Um, it's pretty much uh, just a normal uh, router connect uh, you know, with the method thrown in there. Just map resource makes it a lot, lot easier. Um, so the JSON view is pretty self-explanatory. I prefer JSON. I'm sure almost everybody in this room does. Um, show of hands, who's an XML guy or girl? <laughs> oh man, Graham raised his hand. Now I'm in trouble. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I prefer JSON. It's uh, simple, fast, widespread. Um, and uh, look at the view. You can't, you can't, get much, uh, can't get much simpler than that. If you're not familiar with, oh, how did I change slides? Sorry. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, Request Handler, one of the things it will do is it will uh, map your view to a subdirectory that is the extension of the file. So for example, with the file extensions.json, I can now put my view.ctp in a URLs slash uh, json slash view.ctp folder. Um, so it'll break out automatically. All right, I'm not sure how much time I need to spend on this slide. Um, who here knows what JSONP is? Okay, so I'll, I'll go over this slide. Um, JSONP is uh, JSON with, JSON with padding. Um, pretty much uh, you pass in a callback via the query string and uh, it will wrap that JSON output into the query string. It's very useful for cross-domain uh, uh, cross request because uh, uh, obviously you cannot make an AJAX request cross-domain under normal 
circumstances in JavaScript without proxies and things like that. So I included some code in here. There's not much in the presentation, but here's some. Um, in my, uh, oh, in my uh, controller, this is in my app controller because this can universal. You can turn this on for the entire app all at once. I am checking to see if the callback query parameter exists for the application. Um, if it does, I am setting it to be accessible in the view. And in my JSON slash default dot CTP, I am just checking for the existence of that callback function. And I am uh, echoing it around the output as needed. So that's a really quick, uh, you know, what's there? 15 lines of code uh, to turn on JSONP for all your JSON views across your entire site. And, oh, that's my dashboard. Uh, all right, uh, the XML view, I don't know, has some good points. It's strongly typed, it's human readable. There's tons and tons of existing tools. Um, the strongly type's a pretty big one. Uh, you've all seen in the XML view before. Um, but as before, there's a little XML subdirectory where I can separate all, all my uh, template files. All right, so other views. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on this because uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, because Cake makes it so easy to create these different views and parse extensions that there's really no reason to not have as many of these as you can possibly shove into your API. Um, you know, HTML, YAML, CSV, serialized PHP, AMF, which is Adobe messaging format for those of us who have um, had the pleasure of never having to work with Flex, um, Microsoft Excel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, testing output. Uh, one of the great things about REST is it's easy to test command line with curl if you have a Unix or Linux based system or uh, you manage to get curl running on your Windows. Um, I'll have this slide up online so anybody can use it as a reference if they need to, so I won't go over each one, but pretty much those are the uh, command lines to test each and every one of the requests. Um, the third one's probably the most complicated. Um, it's uh, sending post, uh, the third and the first are sending post data. Um, so at this point, we might be able to call our application done. Uh, we have our MVC files, we have our RESTful views for XML and uh, JSON. Um, we're missing error handling, pagination, authentication, authorization, and documentation. Um, so with what time I have left, I'm going to segue into the uh, second part of my presentation, which will go over those, which are a little bit uh, less generic. Um, all right, uh, this probably, um, a lot of you have seen this one. This is uh, any HTTP status code that's relevant for REST. There's a, a few that aren't on here just because they're not very useful uh, for RESTful applications. I'm going to focus on, or you, I'm going to have code examples or uh, flow for, what is that, one, two, three, seven of them. Um, the ones I put asterisks next to. Uh, I guess I'll, uh, yeah, I'll go over them when I get to them. Um, so uh, the uh, that slides out of order. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is a basic flow for our add method as a RESTful application. Um, as an add method, if it's not post or put request, it shouldn't be calling add. Um, that should be throwing a 405 method not allowed. If, it's, uh, if it already exists, 303 C other, uh, save successful 201 created with a location header uh, of the newly created resource. So you put the location of the uh, new resource dot XML dot JSON, et cetera, uh, 1234 dot XML. Um, and if for some strange reason, the save failed, validation errors, whatnot, 
um, you can uh, throw a 200 error, but uh, put an explanation of why it failed in there. You could also throw a 500, but um, it's debatable which one would actually be right. Uh, 500 being internal server error. Um, the edit method, very similar to add. Um, if it's not a uh, post request, um, just to not contradict myself, this cake's mapping defaults to be a put request also goes here. Um, so if it's not post or put request, uh, four or five method not allowed. Invalid ID, if the user tries to do an edit of ID 1234, um, there are 404. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory unless you have ACL like uh, uh, we saw in Eric's talk, in which case you might not even get to that point. Uh, you might get authentication denied if uh, the right entry isn't in the uh, auth table. But in general, you should be throwing 404 file not found if the ID doesn't exist. Um, success, self-explanatory, that 200 okay, that's the default, you don't even have to do anything for that one. And failure is kind of the same with um, add and delete. Um, if not a post, and this is why I shouldn't be doing, what is that acronym? The copy CPSR? Uh, yeah, I had a CPSR error here. Um, this uh, should say, if not a delete or post request, um, throw 505, uh, 405, sorry. Um, you know, 404 on invalid ID, 200 on success and failure, et cetera. Um, now I'm gonna go back to that slide that was out of order. Uh, so when throwing errors in REST, uh, it's very important to uh, follow a few really simple rules. Uh, the re errors should be in the same format that the, uh, that the results would have been returned in. So if, you're, um, if the user's requesting JSON, throw the error in JSON. If the user's requesting HTML, HTML, XML, et cetera. Um, Twitter is very, very bad at this terrible at it. Um, if you get the fail whale, it used to, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be always thrown back to you in HTML regardless of your request format. That is, um, hopefully no one from Twitter's in the audience, but that's absolutely wrong. Um, it should be, uh, if it's a JSON request, the fail whale should be a JSON fail whale. Um, so, that's my rule number one for throwing errors. Um, it should be descriptive. Um, you should have something human readable that in there and uh, computer readable in there as well with uh, um, we're not, uh, there's no reason not to throw something in there to help out the developer and something in there so the developer can uh, write code that handles it. Um, and it should be comprehensive. And I wanna go back to uh, to jump around a little bit, go back to the add method. Um, I have it throwing a 200 on uh, OK. So what I'm talking about that is uh, usually if the save fails, it's probably a validation error, unless your database is down or something like that. So what I like to do um, is throw a uh, include or encode the uh, information, the validation errors in my JSON response, for example. That way the client can really quickly handle, uh, handle any of the validation errors that crop up. Um, same with uh, 405 errors, the method not allowed. If uh, the method only allows post and uh, put, I like to throw back an array that has post and put in uh, methods, array, post, put, um, so that the client can deal with that in some sort of generic way. Um, and then globally, um, you have your 403 forbidden, which is uh, the user isn't allowed to access the resource, and the 401 unauthorized, which is, means the user's not even logged in. Uh, how you implement those greatly depends on how you implement your ACL. If you have a weak ACL, you can probably just implement those in the controller. Um, if you have strong ACL, then you're probably either gonna wanna be switching your ACL over to controller, model, or object type ACLs, or uh, hacking together your own off class. Um, uh, sorry, uh, off controller rather than ACL. Um, because obviously uh, the default uh, 
action for auth is to just redirect to the login page, which is not what you want to be doing if it's a JSON request. You do not want to redirect an AJAX request to the login page. That would be bad. You want to be returning a uh, JSON format message to tell the user, hey, you need to log in. Um, so implementation, uh, this is my own little hack. Um, don't want to call it hack too much, but. Um, so I, create, I like to create this user error object uh, method inside my app controller, which has an array of all the HTTP uh, response codes, and uh, then sets the header, and then calls cake at an error. Uh, apparently, though, uh, Graham tells us cake error is going away. So I'm not really, uh, this method is probably going to be obsolete in a little while. Um, but that's the gist of it. Options can be things like your validation error and things like that. Um, and uh, cake error will look in the views, errors, error, um, and then whatever number is being passed in right here. I don't know if anybody can see my mouse. Um, so, uh, you know, this is an example 404 error, error404.ctp uh, in the JSON folder or should be in the JSON folder at least. Um, HTTP headers, uh, one of my favorite subjects <laughs> because they're so, uh, there's such diversity in how they're implemented. Um, HTTP headers are usually used for returning meta information, rate limiting in the case of Twitter, pagination, et cetera. I like to uh, turn my pagination into generic pagination. Um, so I like to make sure that any call I have to my API that calls uh, Cake's pagination uh, component has pagination information included in the HTTP headers if the client should decide to use it. Um, I got some code for that one. Um, uh, uses HTTP headers. Um, app, for anybody not familiar, app defined uh, HTTP headers are supposed to, by convention, start with X dash. Um, so all of the headers here start with that. I am uh, overriding in my app controller the paginate, uh, paginate method. Uh, I am uh, calling the parent paginate method with all the appropriate parameters. I uh, got some messy code to get the object, which is uh, unfortunately copy pasted from the uh, main app controller. I, I would love it if there was a uh, more straightforward way to do that one. And then I am uh, setting the three headers for uh, the current page, the limit per page, and the total number of elements per page, which is immensely, immensely useful when you're developing things like uh, iPad apps. Um, so a quick, uh, a few quick notes on uh, multi-platform development. Um, this is a uh, off topic, but use a UI that makes sense. Um, if you're developing a uh, iPad app, uh, I've heard a lot of people say just uh, develop a uh, HTML5 page that displays all your information. Throw that in the iPad. Um, but you're really not bringing anything to the table with that. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not adding anything. Um, if you're going to be doing multi-platform development, uh, add some uh, multi-touch gestures in there and uh, some things like that. Add something that brings some unique value to the, uh, to the application. Uh, a quick uh, segue after that is uh, platform support. I talked about headers a second ago. Um, and those actually aren't supported by all platforms. They are uh, Flex, for instance, does not support uh, headers in REST. Um, it's just a fact of life. I like to use AMF for Flex because I can um, get around stupid restrictions like that. Uh, so. So that pagination method uh, will not actually work in Flex, but if you're using a, um, with REST, but if you're using AMF or some other method, it will work with that. 
uh, because Rust cannot fetch it for some strange reason. Adobe decided that'd be a good thing. Um, so the other uh, quick support, uh, quick note is web browsers do not support delete and put. It's not something they do. Um, they're part of the uh, HTTP spec, um, but there's plenty, plenty of web browsers out there that will not let you create an AJAX request that's a delete or put. Um, so if you are going to be doing either, you can do this uh, cool, little, uh, cool little trick over on the right. Make your AJAX method post instead and uh, post the variable underscore method equals and then the name of the method you actually want to call. Um, this obviously only works for post because of the security reasons I was talking about earlier. If we let you override methods for get, it'd be a very bad situation. Um, so uh, this is actually, uh, I'm not sure who did it first, Cake or uh, um, Ruby on Rails, but Ruby on Rails has the exact same convention. Um, so it's pretty, uh, pretty standard. Cake handles this automatically for you. Um, so just a, a quick example. These uh, two HTTP requests are the equivalent. Um, I have the delete over on the left, and I have the post over on the right passing in the method as the post data. Um, hmm. All right, quick note on authentication. Uh, this is my authentication graph from uh, bad to best. Um, bad, obviously, I hope no one's deploying apps with no authentication whatsoever, unless you're a wiki or something. Um, good, which would be basic authentication, which is, um, you know, HD browser pops up, ask password, et cetera. The problem with that is it's plain text. Um, and uh, good or better, I should say, are the cookie method, which are essentially make a post request to the login method. Login method returns cookie, client stores the cookie, and sends that cookie with each subsequent request, um, which is better. Uh, and it's automatic with Cake. You already have that ability, so which makes it good, nice and quick to implement. Uh, and the digest. Uh, uh, HTTP authentication method is also much better than basic because uh, very few people use Digest, but what it does is rather than sending the password in plain text, it has a shared, uh, it uses the password as a shared secret to encode data that the server gives it. Um, so it takes an extra HTTP request sometimes, but the benefit is it's built into all browsers and there's no, uh, no plain text passwords um, being sent over the line. And obviously the best, as Neil pointed out yesterday, is OAuth um, so far. Um, so if you are developing an API and you're making that API open, I hope you are using OAuth for your authentication. Um, it has, unlike anything else on this chart, it has the benefit of not requiring you to ask for the user's password. The password only gets entered into the API provider site, which makes it the absolute uh, most secure you can get because you don't have to worry about all those crazy uh, API consumers out there hijacking users' passwords like uh, was a problem with Twitter for a while um, until they disabled OAuth about, what, a week ago, a couple days ago? Basic auth, sorry. <laughs> Good catch. Uh, so uh, um, we co just covered authentication, now for authorization. Um, there's really no magic uh, for authorization. Um, for uh, authentication just tells you who the, uh, who the user is. Authorization is what the user can do. Um, for that, you need to either be using the ACL model, uh, the auth mod, uh, sorry, component, um, and, 
or at the very least, checking for user ID, uh, same as the post you're trying to delete, for instance, or the user's a moderator, or the user's administrator. Um, I actually saw on a production site not too long ago uh, the delete method, just deleting a record and never checking the, that the user who actually uh, was deleting the record was, uh, a lot, was the person who created the record. It was, uh, it was very frightening, and that is why I like to touch on authorization when I'm talking about uh, authentication as well. Uh, documentation. Uh, the first one's really only, really only highly ap applicable if you're using XML. Uh, but if you are using XML, you should have a schema file or a DTD file, which are a little older. Um, you should probably be using XML schema instead. Uh, that just describes what the schema is because that gives your uh, consumers the ability to check uh, use their XML editing applications and check to make sure that the file conforms to the uh, standard you set out automatically uh, without having to uh, um, do any manual, anything manually. So that's good. Uh, most uh, small team APIs do not include schemas, uh, which means that uh, third party XML editors and things like that are a lot less useful and validators just won't work at all. Well, they'll give you, is the tag not closed, but they won't tell you, is the tag allowed to be used here? Um, of course, uh, this is probably self-explanatory, but if you are documenting an API, you should have example code and example output and input for all your, uh, all your API methods. Um, take this list as kind of a checklist to do if you're developing an API. If you can't check off each of these bullet points, then uh, you're not done yet. You still have a little bit more documentation to do. Um, you know, and uh, not really documentation, but the last two are just as important, is uh, some sort of community to be able to get feedback from the users who use your API, and uh, a place to send feedback back to them. Uh, one thing I really have to give uh, Twitter credit for is their API status page. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's pretty much uh, yellow, green, or red circles that tell you the status of every single one of their APIs at any given time, um, which is really nice. You don't necessarily have to go to that extent, um, but if your API is down or going down to maintenance, you now have, if it's an open API, you now have people depending on you. You now have people whose own services depend on your services being up, so you should give them the courtesy of telling, uh, telling them when you shut yours down for a few hours for maintenance or whatever. Um, big question. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been asking this, but what about SOAP and AMF, Adobe Messaging Protocol uh, format, sorry. Um, First off, Cake PHP absolutely rocks with REST, so why would you do anything else? Uh, there's actually a couple of good reasons, uh, uh, most of which I touched on a little bit earlier when talking about Flex, is uh, Flex and REST do not mix well together. Uh, lack of header support, uh, really wonky uh, cross, uh, cross domain .xml issues, et cetera. So, there's SOAP and then there's AMF. SOAP is heavy. Uh, it's a pain in the neck to work with. You have to write whistles and all that good stuff. But it, it's, ju it's just not a pleasant experience. But a lot of, uh, there's a lot of clients out there that can read SOAP. And a lot of developers out there that know how to consume SOAP services. Um, the second, AMF is really, really light. The, it's binary. Um, it, it's, um, it's a binary messaging format. It's about as lightweight as you can possibly get for a messaging format. Um, but it requires Flash to consume or some sort of uh, weird third-party library. I'm not sure why you do that. Um, but if you still want to develop SOAP and uh, REST, you can. Uh, SOAP and AMF, you can. 
Uh, and you probably should if you run out of other things to do with your REST API or your Flex client. Uh, this is the flow for both SOAP and AMF. They are pretty much the same uh, because they're both RPC. So the flow is pretty much develop a service controller. Uh, most people like to do this inside a plugin because the controllers tend to have a lot of components and helper classes and things like that. So, uh, and vendor files because a lot, AMF in particular has a very complex AMF parsing libraries. Uh, and then uh, the uh, controller will map the input from the RPC to the destination controller. Uh, so if you're calling users.view, uh, the uh, AMF controller, as I'm going to use in the next example, will map, you map that to the appropriate method inside of the user's controller. Then the controller has to capture the output. Um, I like to, uh, and somebody can probably mention a better way to do this, a more cake way to do this, but I like to just put a return statement at the end of my methods in my controller and use that returned data to put into my AMF and SOAP request. I'm sure somebody will come up to me during lunch and say, no, nah, that's all wrong. Uh, there's a better way to do that. But it works. Um, and then the controller needs to translate uh, the output to a, the messaging format, either SOAP or AMF, a SOAP envelope, if you will. So this is the flow. Uh, user makes POST request. Uh, RPC is always POST uh, to the router. The router then routes the request to the plugin and then to the AMF controller in this example, um, a gateway method in the AMF controller. Um, then the uh, AMF controller will instantiate a user uh, controller and call the view method on it and the user controller will return the data, and then the AMF controller will format it in an envelope and send it back out to the user. So it looks uh, really simple when you put in a diagram like this, but I've had to do it with uh, both AMF and uh, SOAP, and uh, there's a couple good, really good um, plugins on the uh, bakery and elsewhere that help out, but it is really a bit of a pain. Uh, some final words. I touched on this earlier. I hope that I demonstrated well enough that views, multi-view REST in Cake PHP is really, really easy. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be outputting uh, YAML or PDF or Excel spreadsheets for that matter if it makes sense for your data because Cake uh, just uh, takes really takes all the hard work out of it. I've implemented REST in a lot of non-cake uh, frameworks, and it's not nearly as fun. So this is a, a really quick uh, checklist. I couldn't. Uh, I know there's one or two things on here that are missing, but I figured I might as well show it to you anyway. Uh, before you release your API, you know, make sure you have your documentation. Probably one of the most important things in that documentation is example code and example output. Um, make sure you have your definition files. If you have XML, make sure you have your uh, XML schema files. If you have um, SOAP, make sure you have your WSDLs um, or you're generating your WSDLs automatically um, or something along those lines. Web service uh, descriptor languages. If Anybody's not heard the term whistle before. Um, and, uh, you know, I just added this watching the unit test presentation because it, it, it is important. If you're, if you're developing an API and you want to be doing that feedback thing I mentioned earlier, you probably want to know if your API broke. So then hopefully not release the broken code, but, you know, you want to know. So that uh, includes some unit tests in there for good measure. So I have an example app. I need to clean it up and put it on GitHub because everybody tells me I should be using GitHub. Um, 
It's uh, for the uh, short URL uh, service I talked about and touched on briefly. It has examples of all the techniques in this presentation. Um, it can be accessed when I put it up there at tinyur.me uh, because it's a shortened URL service and that's three letters shorter than tinyurl.com. Um, <laughs> So right now it's just a link to my blog on there, but I'll put code up there in a running version of the service at uh, some point tonight or tomorrow. Um, MIT license, so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, I have to do, I have to touch on this. I was talking to Graham about this last night. Uh, today uh, is, um, yeah, it's September 5th. So I have to wish my wife, Laura, a happy anniversary. <laughs> it, it's actually our first anniversary today, um, almost, uh, almost to the hour. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I had a presentation to give. Uh, so I, I hope. <laughs> I, I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, <laughs> And you found it useful uh, because um, I'm going to have to make up for that when I get back. So anyway, once again, um, I'm Andrew. Um, you can contact me uh, whenever you want, andrewcurioso.com slash contact. Uh, that's my blog as well. Uh, my Twitter is at Andrew Curioso. Please follow me. Uh, I'll, I, I promise I'll tweet when I put the source code up for tinyer.me. Um, and if you don't follow me on Twitter, you might miss it. So uh, if that's incentive, uh, I don't know what is. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, Graham has a copy of my book to give away, but I wanted to really quickly have eight minutes. I cut it pretty close, uh, but any questions? Awesome. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, the PowerPoint will be on SlideShare before you finish eating lunch. <laughs> okay, so if the internet cooperates, the PowerPoint will be on SlideShare. Anything else? Anything else? That's a really, really good question. Um, the best, well, th this is not an answer, but don't break backwards compatibility. <laughs> that, that's, that's, the best, uh, that's the best path, but if you don't, um, if you can't go down that route, I'd probably uh, be developing the API as a plugin. The problem is if you develop an API as a plugin, you have a lot of duplicate classes and classes with the same name and things like that. Um, Another alternative is to take in the API version as part of the URL in your route um, or as a query parameter or as a um, HTTP request header if you have the um, luxury of only dealing with clients that can actually set HTTP request headers. So did that answer? Yeah. 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 Good point. All right. Well, thank you.